We're going to take a moment to just generally speak about and provide a minor demonstration of when and why you would choose to use a direct barrier method or an indirect barrier method. Very, very generally speaking, it's going to come down to pain provocation in the patient. So if the mo motion that you're creating is going to create pain in the patient, it's more likely, not exclusive, but it's more likely that it's going to be a direct barrier method or into the direction of bind. It's more likely that decreasing or not provoking pain or pain response in a patient is going to be going indirect or to the direction of ease. These are not exclusive statements. However, they're very general statements that seem to hold true in most circumstances. So again, the basic concept being if what you are doing, whether the patient's in an acute situation, so an acutely painful or an acutely injured situation, or if they're in a chronic situation where there's chronic discomfort, chronic pain, chronic motion loss, it doesn't necessarily make a major difference. What you're looking at is the choice to go indirect is based on trying to avoid provoking pain in the patient, and the choice to go direct is when you can effectively go into the direction of buying without provoking pain. Again, these are very broad overarching statements. They don't hold true all the time. There will be situations in an acute uh, scenario where the patient is acutely injured or in acute pain and going direct or going into the direction of bind actually feels better. We can't absolutely track these things or predict these things, but we know it because we purposely go into the direction of ease and the patient's going to say, ouch. Right? If that's the case, then we go the other direction. We go and we try to find that ease. Now, in a situation like today, what we're going to do is very theoretically, we're going to use uh, common motion in leg rotation to attempt to address the lumbar column. And we're going to assume that the patient isn't in any acute pain and because he's not. But what we're going to do is just talk about this as a guiding concept. So what I would do is I would, through my assessment, I would have identified that there's something in the lumbar column that I want to deal with. Uh, through experience, I would have some belief that using like rotation uh, in a hip flex position is going to effectively give me what I'm looking for as far as treatment is concerned. So as I go into the lumbar column, right, and I come up and I see what happens, if I see the motions that going, are going to happen, if my patient shows that they're in pain, they flinch, they make a noise, they say that they are in pain, then what I can do is even within this motion, although let's assume that the patient has an extended lumbar column and I'm trying to induce flexion, right? This is a hip flexed position, so it's biased towards lumbar flexion as well. But even in this position, I can start to find a position of ease, right? So if this is the direct bind and the patient says, ouch, I can come away. And now one of the things that you won't necessarily see is my arm over here, my forearm has contact with the patient's pelvis. And as such, what I can do is I can use my forearm to create short lever motion. So if you look over there, you'll see the patient shimmy and shake, right? Because I'm using my forearm. So what I can start to do is even in this hip flex position, which begins to approach lumbar flexion, I can start to find my position of ease, right? So I can position to ease of the soft tissue. So we spoke about this before. When going indirect, we want to position to ease or to make the soft tissue squishy, the soft tissue soft, right? And then we talk about the concept of compression, distraction, torsion, and shear. So in this situation, I start to position. Now, as far as shear is concerned, in a situation like this, if I'm thinking about the lumbar column and the coronal plane, I can push my forearm into the patient and that creates a shear. And in this case, you're going to have to take my word for it because you can't see it or feel it, but we get an increase in softening in the lumbar soft tissues that I have contact with. So now I can go compression, that tightens the tissue up. Distraction's hard, right? I can wrap around and pull up and that makes the tissue a little bit tighter in this case. Then I can create essentially rotation or sorry, torsion, um, which really is kind of a rotation, right? That doesn't really give me what I want. What gives me what I want is positioning to relative ease and then pushing my forearm into the patient to create some form of shear. So I've gone through all of my, <clears throat> all of my activating forces and we get the ease. Now, if the situation were that the patient didn't express pain, which in this case they didn't, then I would start to kind of go through the same process. I would approach the direct barrier, right? Now I can just be rhythmic and repetitive in the direct barrier. Or what I can do is I can go to the direct barrier, compression, distraction, 
torsion and shear, and I can see what gives me more tension and more motion. So as far as choosing to go direct or indirect, like we said, we're looking at the concept of pain provocation. If I choose to go direct on whatever I found, whatever I've assessed, then I'm assuming that the patient is not going to have an increased amount of pain based on what I do. If they happen to, so if I've made the hypothesis, or I've come to the hypothesis that I'm going to be able to go direct with the patient to the direct barrier, and they do express pain, then what I'm going to do, even in that position, I don't necessarily have to change my method, but I can just go to that concept of tissue softening, even within that biased position where I'm approaching the direct barrier, I can start to look for softening. So when they express pain, I'm going to go indirect. When they don't express pain, I can continue to go direct. When I'm going indirect or direct, as we've talked about with patient activating forces, they're all available to me. So whether I choose to go indirect, right, to get the tissues to soften, then I can go compression, distraction, torsion, and shear. If I go direct, I can do the exact same thing. Like we said in the previous video about the concept of activating forces, you can create your own algorithm, and there will also be times where even if you have your own algorithm where you go through in a, a clear sequence, based on the position that you're in with respect to the patient, you may have a very hard time going through the algorithm that you want because they're not necessarily easy to do. You might go, uh, for myself, in a situation like that, compression is easy, uh, torsion, or sorry, shear is easy as far as the coronal plane and the lumbar column because my forearm is in contact with the pelvis. So that's an easier thing to do. So I may juggle my algorithm, my, my sequence a little bit. However, I, at least I have one to start with and recognize the point at which it isn't as useful because the motions in that order are not as easy to create. So again, we just come back to the concept of having a clear path and as far as choosing direct or indirect, it's about pain provocation.